Well, you know what? Oh, it's recorded by the host. Okay. Got it. Anyway, uh, he said there's a refugee home very near where he lives in Dorking. And that's how I got there. I managed to get to Dorking, the refugee home, which was given by the Duke of Newcastle for the time of the, of the, um, the war. Great. Well, let's just pause for a minute and imagine your parents now in Poland, um, although I think they thought of themselves probably as Austrians from Vienna, who have just sent their three sons by ship to England, never to see them again. And perhaps imagine what they were thinking and feeling and seeing it's Tisha B'Av, perhaps we can quote Jeremiah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are not. Well, as it happens, um, I have some letters which I got translated a few months ago. Uh, they were for my parents, who to my brother, who was only 10 at the time, to say to him to look after his little brother, that's me. Now, my father also wrote something and said, don't forget to send a postcard when you get to London. And that's what they, so they thought that maybe they will see us again. I don't know. I've, I know that my father died in Auschwitz. I have no idea what happened to my mother. I've tried, I've looked, all the agencies, none of them can work it out whether she died at, in the Warsaw Ghetto or somewhere else. So let's go back to you, age four, in Dorking. How did the Kreibichs come across you and foster a nice little Jewish boy like you? Well, I don't know about being a nice little Jewish boy, but in that refugee home, Birchett House, they were all Jewish families, except one. They were all also refugees, but they came from the German-speaking Czechoslovakia. Nobody wanted to take a, a, a scrawny guy like me. I was scrawny with a lot of skin problems, but they took me. They were already grandparents. And it's, it's there I stayed for seven, maybe eight years. I went to primary school. I went to grammar school. But I was always with them, even though the Jewish community wanted me to go to an orphanage in Wickham, High Wickham. But the social workers in Dorking said, that's not a good idea. He's happy where he is. He should stay. And they were right. Great. Well, let us just at that point uh, leap on to a question that I was going to ask you right at the end, which is, have you managed to be in touch with any of the Krybich family since? And the answer clearly is yes, because somewhere in the audience is Tina, who I think is the great granddaughter of the people who fostered you. So Tina, very welcome. And we'll, I'm sure, hear a bit more about you. So Eric, tell us about life in Dorking with the crime. Well, let me tell you, first of all, how I re-met Tina, as you've mentioned her. A few months ago, I get a phone call from the Association of Jewish Refugees that somebody's looking for me. So I said, well, give them my number and we'll find out. It turns out that it was Tina, a great-granddaughter of the Krybichs who looked after me. So I asked her, how did you get hold of me? Well, it seems, and maybe I'm wrong, but it seems that an aunt of hers asked her to write, to read my book. And in the book, The Boy in the Statue, in the book, there's a picture 
of her mother when she was a, she's a, about four years, she was about four years younger than me. Unfortunately, she died quite young, her mother. And that's why she didn't know anything about her past. And we had to tell her. Now, life in Dorking, well, it was very good. The crime was very good to me. Uh, they included me in everything. And I knew their grandchildren, including the mother of Tina, Sonia. And, uh, well, I had a few accidents, but, you know, you don't want to know all of them. <laughs> Um, well, uh, somewhere in your book, you do suggest that uh, as part of your growing up in Dorking, you almost killed yourself, if I recall. Yes, well, uh, on a, I can't remember exactly when, but I was about 10 years old and my foster parents asked me to take a big parcel to some friends of theirs at the other end of Dorking. And for that, I had to take their go-kart. And Sonia said she'd, like, she'd love to come with me. Now, I was sworn not to ride in it. And so I swore. You know, what you learn from this is that parents ask their children to swear to something, which they do, but they don't keep it. And I, obviously, we rode in it, and I landed up in a wall, past the church, down the road, through past the high street, and the next thing I know, I'm awake in the cottage hospital, which is right beside Birchett House. Anyway, the first thing I asked is, am I having my tonsils out? And the answer was no. But one day, about a week before I was allowed to, to go out, my foster mother came running in the garden because I could look over the bar. I got up then, and um, she came with a, a piece of paper fluttering. You got through. I totally forgot that, meanwhile, I had to do the 11 plus many, many years ago. And how I passed, I have no idea because I still couldn't speak fluent English. And no, I had nobody to help me because they only spoke German. And so the Krybich spoke to me in German and I spoke to them in English. But at the end, I got to Dawkins Grammar School. Wonderful. Uh, now let's go back just for a minute. You mentioned Jacques and Ossie. Um, yeah. Ossie under instructions to look after you. Um, but you're in Dorking by yourself. Uh, yeah. Did you meet, come across them again? Did they come across you? Well, uh, I was playing with my scooter outside the, the Birchett house when a young man, he was about 17, came on his bicycle and he asked me, where do Mr. and Mrs. Kreibich live? I showed him. I went down and continued playing with my little tricycle. You know, the tricycle is, is a big thing now, but it wasn't then. And I, and I only had a wooden one with no motor or anything. Anyway, my foster mother came running down and told me, you know who that was? That was your brother. That was Jacques. He always knew where I was, but for one reason or another, he was young and he couldn't come. It, maybe because of the war. He had meanwhile been in Ely and then he went to Cambridge and he was on his way to the, there's a Habon, there was once a Habonim Bachshara down in Bosom near Chichester. It doesn't exist anymore. And on the way, he came to look for me to make sure that I'm okay. And suddenly from going to church and Sunday school, which I used to do, I was Jewish. Now, it's a big thing at the age of 10 that you change your, your religion. Never mind, you don't know what, what happened to your parents because that doesn't come into it yet. Um, you change your religion, and I had to go to classes to the local. He, was, I think, he was a rabbi. The smells were very different to the ones I was used to, and uh, the food was very different because it was all kosher. I, there was no kosher food in Birchett House, I can assure you. 
So uh, one way or the other, I, um, yes, I met my brother. He told me I have another brother and I have an uncle and my parents were somewhere in Poland. And that's all I knew at that particular point. Fine. Okay, well, let's uh, press on with your life just for a bit. Um, if I remember, your foster father died at about this time. Yeah. Well, um, what you see, I used to live in a very small room, which connected to their room, which connected to the uh, corridor where the toilet was. And uh, one of those days, and they used to go out and lock the door. Well, I had big problems because I knew I had to do a pee. So I did it through the window. And then one evening, I, I well, oh yeah, I know, I remember what happened. I was selected to the reserve football team. So I must have been already in the grammar school. I never played because we won, but I was late home. And nobody liked that at all. So I was told to go to bed without supper. I went, no screaming, no, nothing helped. And off I went. Now, my foster father was a carpenter, a very good one, in fact. And um, I went to bed, went to sleep and woke up and heard a noise next door. And I opened the door and my foster mother told me that father my father had died. He had angi angina pectoris, which you don't die from today, but he did die then. And he lay on his bed for seven days. And in order to get out, I had to go past the bed. It was a horrible time, but he was a, he was a lovely man. And he was very good with his hands, which I'm not. And uh, I, he, he made a Meccano set for me. And unfortunately, I couldn't do anything with it. So he did it instead. He built, it, he built up a, a, a wonderful castle of some kind or the other. Um, but, you know, if, when you die suddenly, and he was only 49 or 50, so he was quite young. Uh, he's buried in a cemetery in, in, um, near Dorking. Mm. In fact, I have a letter from Ralph von Williams. Uh, it was in the news in the local newspaper, and I have a letter from Ralph von Williams, who to his this is a copy um, to um, Emily, that is his wife, my foster mother, saying how sorry he is that um, uh, Joseph, that's my foster father, died because. Uh, he did all the handiwork in, in the house itself. Yep. And that's, that's how we survived. Then you moved to London for a brief period. Uh, and then, age 13, you went on Aliyah. Now, how did that come about? Well, <laughs> the Jewish community didn't give up. They thought, I'm not getting enough Jewish history, Jewish culture. So they persuaded me much to my chagrin today, to go to London. But where? Ah, it's the Hasmonean School. Now, the Hasmonean School is a very religious affair, and that I wasn't used to. So I lasted for one term. And then my aunt, my mother's younger sister, she lived in Haifa and came straight after the war, she came to the children. And um, she said, why don't you come to Haifa? So I joined Youth Aliyah, and we went to a, well, so a sort of a, a training uh, in Thaxted and took out sugar beets. So I simply asked a question, do you have, in the middle of winter, sugar beets in Israel? Of course not. <laughs> but that's, that, that, that was the training that we had. And that's how I got to Israel. I arrived in Haifa in 1949. And you then lived with your aunt and uncle 
and tried to learn Ivrit, but that didn't last very long before uh, you moved to uh, Kibbutz. Um, oh, no, well, you see, my aunt had no children, she couldn't have. And she spoiled her husband no end. And he didn't like the idea of a young whipsnay like me suddenly appearing there. So we, start, we started looking for somewhere to go and there was a, a wedding, I think it was a wedding in Neshel, which is very near Haifa, of an, the nearest brother to my, to my father and his son was getting married. And uh, amongst the guests was a young uh, a man called Eliezer. He, you know, where was he? He's a cousin of mine, but he was in the Chavia. And he said, we've got a school here. Why don't you come here? And that's where I went. I mean, to be fair, the Reali school in Haifa would have, would have accepted me if I spoke Hebrew, but I didn't. <laughs> So you're now on Kibbutz Merchavia. Yeah. And you stayed there for? Well, I, I arrived when I was about, uh, I must have been 14, and I stayed there till I was 22. So part of my schooling is actually in Merchavia. Now, Merchavia is a very left-wing kibbutz. So coupled with the fact that I grew up with a Christian family, you can you you know what the outcome is and the outcome is very simple i'm not very religious however it, it, the whole educational system then not now but then was different you did what you wanted so when there were english lessons i didn't have to go i went to play basketball but the whole class came with me <laughs> and they they should have learned a bit of English. But they preferred to come with me and play basketball. All the teachers very well. The music teacher, Hila Berlioz, a fantastic. Uh, Tuvia, who was my literature teacher, he loved Shakespeare. I mean, I and Shakespeare, we, we get on quite well. And uh, mind you, in Hebrew, to go to the Abima in Tel Aviv and listen to Otello isn't very easy. <laughs> However, I did. Uh, and my history teacher, who then left and went to Ein Chalod with his wife, which is another kibbutz, uh, he taught us our history. As far as he was concerned, the Bible, the Old Testament, the Tanakh is, is our history. Yeah, okay. A little bit of pepper and salt, you know, added on a little bit of imagination. So sometime in this period, you met Jacques again, who at this point was married, if I recall. No, no, I met Jacques a bit later. Ah. Because, you know, I met him for the first time, he came with his, uh, this was his second wife. He came, he was going to Europe in general to, for business. But because he had come beforehand to uh, Israel for the 48 war, I had to catalog all his records and God knows what. He knew the system. And when he came, I was already in the army. And he managed to get, for me personally, he got um, a pass, a three-day pass to go to Haifa, where my aunt lived, and to be there with him and his, his wife, uh, uh, Ruth was her name. And she, they, had, they had two boys together. And that's when I met Jack. <laughs> that was the first time. Oh, no, no. No, the very first time was when I arrived in Israel in 1949, because he was already there with his wife, Jean, his first wife. Yep. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't meet him then. Right. 
now then you're in the army um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, of all things you were attacked by an israeli with a knife who wanted yeah. to kill you apparently <laughs> well but apparently he didn't succeed no he didn't i'm still here no well you see the army is 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 something on its own and when you're there you're in a balloon you 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 you're surrounded nobody can get at you and i will remember for my dying day the first day i had this was um a uh, a ground regiment called givati and this young man I'll, I'll, I'll get to the knife in a minute this young man from Yemen, half my size, put his stick, he was a sergeant, he put his stick in my stomach and said, Reich, there is one way only, you can, there are two ways you can get out of here. Either you go by ambulance or you serve your two and a half years. Now, after we finished our uh, initial training, I was sent to the old age company very very quickly i learned why because when you go to prison while you're in the army it doesn't count so most of the people there were you know 30 31 32 and there's me 21 20 21 anyway the um, officer said you know what i think they need their hair cut do me a favor get the hairdressers coming tomorrow like get them to, to, to cut their hair. And this one guy <laughs> kept saying, no, I won't, I won't. I said, if you won't, I'll go and tell the officer. And the next thing I know, they told me they, they are shouting everywhere to, to die. And he ran over me with a knife, with a bayonet. Unfortunately, I went to, to see, to visit him in prison and then he said, well, I, there's no way I'm going to allow a whipper, whippersnapper Ashkenazi to tell me what to do. I'm, 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 I'm a Svaladi, I'm from Morocco, so you can't do anything. The only other thing that I remember very well, in that particular um, battalion, there was a, Romanian, a young Romanian. He was totally out of place. I don't know why he was there. And one morning I, I woke up. And I heard a shot and I rang to his tent and he was dying and he died in my arms. It's very difficult to, you know, one has to understand that this, this is the beginning of the Israeli army and they didn't quite know how to deal with everyone. And this was a very delicate young man from, as I said before, from Romania. And he couldn't cope with all these ex-prisoners i don't know why he, he must have been in prison as well because otherwise he shouldn't be there anyway those are the two those are the two bedeviling things in the beginning of my army service so you became a paratrooper after that and served in the 56th war yeah well that's another story because you see in between i um i was in this uh sergeant's officer uh, sergeant's course near Beit Jibrid. and you must remember wherever you go in Israel there is a past there is history there's archaeology there's everything and my um, commander was a guy called Barlev and he said I want you to stay another ter another term so I said to him there were two, there was three of us in fact, three kibbutzlikim, one from Enkharod, one from Yagul, and, and me. And we said we don't want to because we want to go to the officer's course. And in order to go to the officer's course, you have to stay on, whatever you like, you have to stay on at least a year. So he organized, Barlev, he used to be, he then became minister of police or something, I don't know. Anyway, he organized for us to go to, to officer's course after our second term in the sergeant's course and only stayed the three months or we had to. Of course, I volunteered to be a paratrooper. And then 
as a result of which I fought in the 56 war. Now let's jump quite a bit of your life, if I may. Um, okay. You became a shaliach for Hashomer Hatzair, and you were sent to Manchester, and then went back to Israel, came to London and went back to Israel. Uh, and then finally you came back to London, um, and you joined the Thompson Group and worked for the Times. What well, were you doing there? How? Well, it's very interesting that the, the it was a very interesting time because the Thompson Group, headed by Lord Thompson, who then who then owned the Times newspapers, they were also the first to do these short trips to Mallorca, three or four days for eighteen quid. Not bad, huh? You can't get you can't get to Mallorca for eighteen pounds now. But you could then. And um, so I, I worked there for a while at uh, Thompson and um, persuaded them to have a, this is very interesting, because they were looking for new, new places and, what, and he was always against going to Israel. But I persuaded him to go to Israel. So I asked El Al for 70 seats. They came to my office. And then I, I explained what we were, what, what we had planned, and then they spoke in Hebrew. Oh, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about, and so on and so forth. So I shut them up, and in Hebrew, told them, "Let's start again. We want seventy seats for Jerusalem, and we will. We won't sell seat owners. We'll sell them as a, a proper package." And uh, it was it worked very well. In fact, uh, we also invited we we did weekends to Moscow. And I remember we invited the the uh, ambassador or, or somebody, and he went to the reservations, and uh, and you know they, they were chatting here and there. And one of the girls asked him, "Are there any places in this world that have passports that you don't allow into Moscow?" And one of them was Israel. So when he came back to the office, at that point I was I only had Israeli passport. He asked me, "Have you ever been to Moscow?" I said, "No, I've got one of those passports. You don't let in." But he did. He let me in. And then you left Thompson, um, and via Peltors, yeah. you joined Thomas Cook. Well. That's, that's another story. Thomas Cook has been around a long, long time. It, it, well, it is, he was an innovator. If you remember, Thomas Cook started the package holiday by using a train from Loughborough to Leicester, and he filled it up. So he decided, why not do a few beach tours? Where to? Liverpool. So he did the beach tours to Liverpool and he filled them up. So he then did beach tour, uh, other tours to the Holy Land because he was a sort of a, you know, a, a bit religious. And uh, the upshot of, of it all was that Thomas Cook, I mean, has had a history. Now I looked at their history and I thought it'd be a good idea to do one or two things that he didn't do, he wasn't able to do. Right. So you organized um, a performance of Aida, if I recall, in, uh, in Egypt. Yeah. Well, you see, during this time, we decided to do the relief of, first of all, the relief of Khartoum, uh, because they tried to save General Gordon, as we all know they didn't. But they used the, the ships that were owned by Thomas Cook and paid them a lot of money. I think it was something like 300,000 pounds. Now, in 18, whatever it was, that's a lot of money. Anyway, we then, somebody from Vienna, an Egyptian, Mitwalis was his name, suddenly sent me a, uh, he didn't have emails and they had um, a fax, sent me a fax and said, why don't we do Aida in Luxor? 
I thought it was, I mean, I like music, so I thought it was a good idea. So <laughs> I told all the Thomas Cook officers, no, no response. But I also told the newspapers. And as a result, the Daily Telegraph did a, a paragraph and I had 600 people immediately who wanted to go, including, um, what's his name? I can't remember. He was the deputy prime minister. Anyway, he came on with his own airplane just to see Aida Renaxo. Now, it's fascinating to see Aida because if you, if you recall, the story of Aida is all to do with Egypt. And it's all to do with, with um, uh, down the south in the Nile. And to see actual Egyptian people right next to the River Nile is something just different. We had Placido Domingo. He sang the, the main part. He only sang the first night. But that, that was OK. And all, and all my directors came before they threw me out. Now that, if I recall from your book, um, you were invited to lunch with Boutros Boutros Ghali, then yeah. the uh, Deputy Prime Minister who was uh, at a meeting in Lancaster House. Correct. It was, I, I, I suddenly I get an invitation from a guy called Tim Renton, who was then the, I think, I don't know what he was, he was Minister of Foreign Affairs, would I come to Lancaster House? So, so, so I said, well, why should I come to, oh, it's got nothing to do with me. No, 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 no. we've got this guy, Boutrous Gali Gali from Egypt. He's the, I think he was then the tourist minister. And they want to thank you because as a result of Aida in Luxor, tourism went up again. I mean, tourism to Egypt goes up and down like a yo-yo, but it went, it was, it was on the up. So there we sat in Lancaster House and uh, they thanked me and with the Lord here and Lord there and God knows. And then, and then my boss asked me to come to the office, which was right around the corner. <laughs> so I went there and he said, Eric, we don't get on. You're fired. <laughs> and that was, that was Thomas Cook. Which was uh, an interesting way of starting your own business. Um, <laughs> That's exactly how I started. Well, you see, to, it, I, I had a few contacts. Uh, travel south from the deep south didn't work very well. I tried various things, but in the end, I came up with this idea. Uh, I have a friend, Morris Collins, who, who had a daughter at Ravenswood. And uh, he said, isn't there anything you can do to help out? So I said, well, I, I really don't know. I can give you some money, but that's, that's nothing. And then I came up with the idea to do a bike ride from Dan to Belsheba. Believe it or not, the Israelis thought I was mad. Well, I mean, nobody cycled then. But we had 600 people. No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I've just been corrected. They had 240 people who raised 600,000 pounds. And there were two charities. One was Ravenswood, and the other one was the Ed Edinburgh Medical Missionary Society. Now, they have a hospital in Nazareth. And I said to them, why don't you join? So they joined. We went from Dan to Belsheva. We had a few problems on the way because uh, Jews being Jews like to change their mind and whilst we try to organize everything in advance where with whom and they anyone would sleep by the time we got there they wanted somebody else they, they had made friends with somebody else anyway we saw tonight we had terrible problems I was up till three or four in the morning trying to sort out all these lovely people to, so they have somewhere to sleep. I also had my two little boys with me who helped give, uh, give water to the cyclists and they raised 600,000 pounds between them, which actually is a lot of money. Well, uh, now in your book, you uh, comment interestingly about the difference between the uh, 
Jewish members of your uh, group and the non-Jewish members of your group. Uh, and I suppose uh, to avoid being called woke or being cancelled, we'll draw a discreet veil over all of that. Um, but move on to uh, the first kinder transport reunion of the Association of Jewish Refugees, to which you were invited. Well, yes, I was invited. I, I knew nothing about the kinder transport at that particular point. It was in Harrow, and it was it was organised by Berta Leverton. And she thought it would be a good idea to have a reunion for two or three days. And there I, I met, I, I, there was no nothing about Dorking. I mean, I knew there wouldn't be anyway. So I went to Ely. It was divided off, when I, the, the, the day I went, it was divided off where you went to, not where you where it came from. And there was Ely. So I said, well, you don't know me, but you might know one of my brothers. So one guy says, oh, why, I know you too. Oh, you do? And the, why, how do you know me? Because I came on the Val Shaba with you. And what was I doing? You were running after your brother. Schnell, papier, papier, paper, quick. I've no idea if I made it or not. Well, yes, diarrhea strikes at the most unexpected <laughs> occasions. <laughs> Now, shortly after that, you became a model for a statue. Now, when I think of an artist's model, I must say you are not the first face that comes to mind. <laughs> well, How did that come about? Well, the guy who made it was, his name was um, Frank Meisler. Uh, he came on the Kinder Transport. He was born in Danzig, which is now Gdansk. Uh, and uh, he came to England and then he went to Israel. But he actually was a, he, he died about 10 years ago. He's about 10 years older than me. Uh, he, uh, he was a sculptor. And one day the AJR and the WJR, World Jewish Relief, decided to do a monument for the Kinder Transport at Liverpool Street Station. So Frank said, send me a picture of you when you were about five or six. So I sent him a picture. And then I said, was it okay? Yeah, yeah, it was okay. The only problem I've got is how do I make a mensch out of a hooligan? So I then asked him, but why did you put a violin there? And I mean, my feet. So he said, doesn't every Jewish boy play violin? I said, no, I don't. <laughs> anyway, that's how, it, that's how it happened. And now there are statues all over Europe. Uh, he, he died about... Not all of you. No, no not of me. No, no, no. There's one in Berlin, there's one in, in Hamburg, and there's one in Gdansk, and somewhere else, I can't remember. Anyway, they're all over the place. Well, uh, if you go to Liverpool Street Station, there is a, a group of children cast in bronze, of which the boy with the violin case is modelled on Perich. Correct. Now, uh, sometime about this time, you married Linda. Yes. <laughs> how did you come to meet her, or how did she come to meet you? Well, she came from, she comes from Scotland. She always tells me she comes from Scotland, but she does. Glasgow. And they had a big group who, who Cosgrove Care. Oh, Cosgrove, Cosgrove, Cosgrove Grove Care. And they cycled uh, the same route from down to Belshire or wherever it was. Uh, and then the following year, she came again. But it was a very small group to join up. And then she saw me, and everybody knew me because I had a, I, I, I led the group. So she said, um, hello, Eric. And so I said, I don't, I remember you, but I don't remember your name. That didn't go down very well, but anyway, that's what it happened. And um, on the way back, so I, you know, we met and we talked and, and that's how I met her on one of oh, great. So, my tours. So cycling is not just good for your physical and mental well uh, health, it's uh, also good for marital bliss to be recommended right. to all of us. That was nine, nearly, that was over 20 years ago. Wow. So uh, let's move on to 2010. 
when you were knighted actually by Prince Charles. Uh, now, I know you're much too modest to explain why you were knighted, so I will tell everybody that your charity cycle tours and other charity activities had raised 60 or 70 million pounds. Um, and for this, I think you were knighted, but the ceremony didn't go quite as expected, if I recall. Well, we did have to um, rehearse, which need to kneel on what to do and how to go, go away from him. When I got there, I was just behind um, Nicholas Heitner. Uh, Nicholas Heitner, who also became a knight. That uh, he was, he goes by alphabetical. Reich is, comes up after H. Anyway, I knelt on the wrong knee. So Prince Charles, in his charming way, whispered to me, I'm glad one of us knows what to do. So I quickly went to the right knee. He gave me the medal. And then you're supposed to take it backwards. You're supposed to take a couple of steps and then bow and go. But I didn't. Oh, no. I just turned around and went. <laughs> And I was very lucky not to be beheaded. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pleased that you haven't. Um, and I suppose at this point we must come to the highlight of your career, which is joining MHS, Moswell Hill Shul. <laughs> and on that note, uh, I will say thank you very, very much indeed for talking to us and hand you across to Beth, who will, uh, I hope, have a whole pile of interesting questions from the audience. So once again, Eric, thank you very much from me and indeed everybody else. And, and over I, to Beth. And I would like to thank you for interviewing me. That was a pleasure. You did very well. <laughs> you both did very well. Thank you, both of you. Um, does anybody have any questions for Eric? If you'd like to unmute yourself and, uh, and just ask him. Anybody? Well, while they're thinking, I shall uh, ask a question. Uh, you uh, said early on, I think, that you were sort of tone deaf and totally non-musical, but subsequently uh, you said you're a great fan of classical music and opera. Uh, does that include the music of Ray Fawn Williams, by the way? Well, I, I, have his, his, I have his CDs. I don't often play them because I, it's a bit heavy, his music. I prefer Beethoven, Schubert, Mozart, you know, the good old boys. Uh, the reason I, I didn't think I was stone deaf, the piano teacher thought I was stone deaf. And, she's, and she was, uh, well, I didn't want to call her an old hat, but she was a sort of elderly, uh, probably about 40, 45. And uh, she was persuaded that I shouldn't have any lessons. Meanwhile, I do like music very much. Great. Well, can I ask you a slightly more serious question, unless Beth has got anybody else? No, good. I shall press on in that case. Can I ask uh, you a question, David? Can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, what, happened to your, what happened to your brothers? Well, my middle brother that brought me he was born with an illness called um, osteomyelitis. Now, at that time, they used to use a lot of x-rays in Central Europe, and he died at the age of 27 of cancer. He's buried in Raynham Cemetery. My older brother, Jacques, the one who found me afterwards on his bicycle, he, went, he lived in Australia and died three weeks ago. He was 94. So I'm the only one left. Thanks. Thanks Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we have anybody, anybody else? else? Otherwise I shall ask yet another question just to encourage somebody else to come in. Uh, Eric, your start in life, which was, uh, I suppose, pretty unfortunate by anybody's standards, to what extent do you think it has affected you and your subsequent life, or how has it affected you and your attitude and life? Well, 
I, I think about it quite a lot. I think what, what has happened is I needed a partner. I needed somebody to talk to. And I, 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 it's something I, I, I've only now got since I'm in my 60th, 70th year. And I think that, that has in, in some ways affected me. Now, on top of that, I was never very, very close to my brothers, from which I'm very sorry. I mean, I had a great affection for Ossi, my middle brother, but I didn't see a lot of him. I went to Israel and he stayed in England because he was already ill. And my other brother, Jacques, who I see one, or oh, I used to see once in a year, maybe twice a year, but he, he lived in Australia. And it's not easy to get to Australia. I went to Australia. I met him once or twice there. And I met him in Switzerland because he used to have a house in Switzerland. And I used to travel there and he came to London as well. So I, I met him, but we, we, weren't very, we weren't as close as I would have liked to have been. And I think that's what affected me. It also, I suppose, when things happen, I try to forget as quickly as possible, if they're negative, I mean. And that's what has happened to me from my childhood. I blanked out everything that happened there. I blanked out my parents. I blanked out the ship that we came on. And only in Dorking is the first time I, I really remember everything. And it's very interesting that that's the way I, I am this, to this very day. Thank you. Susanna's got a question. Do you want to unmute yourself, Susanna? Um, hi. Um, that was just really, it's really fascinating, Eric. Thank you um, so much. I was just, I was interested in um, finding out a bit more about the, um, your foster family and what brought them to the UK, obviously, because they weren't Jewish. So I was just sort of quite interested why they um, also escaped from Germany. Well, you see, they were socialists and Hitler didn't like socialists. And when he went into Czechoslovakia, they had to flee. They felt they had to flee. They were right. They had two sons. One fled with them. And that's where Sonia and then Tina comes in. And the other one stayed in Germany. I can't remember his name at the moment, but he became a German soldier. So he came not because he was Jewish, because he came because Hitler was a racist and he did not like socialists. I mean, they, they, they were, you know, they were more like political refugees. And they came about a year before me, couldn't speak a word of English. I don't know how they got to Birchett House, I haven't a clue. All I know is that they looked after me very, very well. Yeah, no, it's really wonderful. I was just, yeah, it's just sort of so fascinating. You kind of don't think of it as, you know, sort of um, that you would end up with a German family in the UK. Um, sort of very, very interesting. Thank you. Pleasure. Anybody else like to ask a question? Are you, are you in touch with any other kinder transport? Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm the chairman of the English part of the kinder transport. Quite a few of them are now in America and a few and quite a lot of them in, uh, in Israel. It's a, a, a very interesting story on our 70th anniversary, what was it, the 70th? I think it was, we invited um, Richard Attenborough and he tells us that his parents took in two girls, two kinder. Now, that was quite difficult. And they, they said to the three boys, there were three boys, they said to them, We'll, we love you very much, but everything is divided into five now because we've got the two girls. Now, the girls found uncles in America and they went to America. One of the girls came back with a boy in tow and said to, to uh, the parents, we want your blessing, which I think is quite something.
Very nice story. Lovely. Um, Jane's got a question. Um, yeah, I'm just curious um, to hear a few words from Tina of how the, her perspective and how, you know, her, her rekindled interest, if that's possible. I have no idea. She's... she's still with us. I'm not sure she's still with us. Yes. Yes, there she is. Yeah. 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 Oh, right. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, I don't really know what to say. Um, the, the kind of the background is my my mum died before my children were born, um, and she didn't really speak much about growing up when when I was growing up. Um, and obviously, after I had children, I had a, a lot of of questions about where I came from and and sort of the history. And I eventually asked my, my aunt and uncle, um, and as, as Eric said, it was um, my aunt that suggested I read his book, um, as that would, would give me some background. And, and then obviously I, I felt I really wanted to, to contact him and just thank him for, for giving that little bit of insight into to my family, to our family. Um, and, and we've been very lucky and, and sort of met up a couple of times since and, and Eric's got some wonderful stories about my mum and some lovely family photos as well that, that I just wouldn't have seen without him. Um, so I feel really, really honoured to have, have, have been able to meet him and have him in my life. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you both. Thank you. I mean, I'm delighted that we are in contact now because I used to be very friendly with her mother. I mean, I was very young. Uh, I, was, I was born in 35, she was born in 39, but nevertheless, I knew her quite well. And I think to, to have some connection to the crybis is really, is important to me personally because it is my background. It is, I grew up in very formative years from the age of four or five to the age of, to, to my bar mitzvah. When I left 12, 13, I went to Israel. I went to uh, London. We've got one more question from Susanna. Hello. Hi, Eric, <laughs> again. Um, yeah, I was just curious to know whether you've been back to Vienna to see where, you know, where you were born. I know you said you don't, you don't obviously remember, um, you know, anything until after you got to the UK. Um, but, you know, have you, have you been back to, to sort of trace your, um, your roots? Well, back not to trace my room i don't like the people but the, it, it is a beautiful and i went to the cemetery once or twice my aunt that is my mother's younger sister she put on the grave of her father who died very young N nothing to do with the war he died of natural causes uh, it, the vienna cemetery is very very large and there are two parts to it one is the old jewish cemetery and one is the new one so she put up a, a tombstone and on it she also wrote my parents who had died. So there is part of Vienna that I, you know, I, I can't help it. I like it. I like the strudel, I like the <laughs> schnitzel and, and all things like that. But that, that's me. I can't, I can't sort of, I can't throw it out, throw it away. So I mean, I was asked a few weeks ago what I remember of the culture. I don't, but Vienna, it was at one point, the early 19th, 20th century, it was the center of music, of uh, literature, of art, of everything. It was very, very cultural. Unfortunately, it had a very splintered empire and that dissolved after a while i i go back i do go back 
and I've been back to the house where I lived with my parents, which is not far from what they call the Riesenrat. Riesenrat is like the, uh, the one in um, on the Thames. What's the it called? Eye. The, the Eye. But, but much smaller. It was built many, many years ago, and I've been on it. And I'll tell you something very interesting. If you remember, I doubt that you may, probably didn't, never saw the, the, the film, but uh, there's a film called The Third Man. And on that, Orson Welles tells his story, what it's like to be a, a gangster. Now, one day, my uncle, we're going back many years now, said, Eric, would you like to see something on Vienna? So I said, oh, yes, of course, I'd love to. And then we went to see the third man. Now, he then said, do you remember the piece where the cat goes over the shoes? Yes, of course I remember. He said, that wasn't Orson awesome Welles, that was me. I don't know, I, 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 I can't vouch for it. <laughs> but that's what he said. He, 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 was a, he was a real storyteller. But yes, I go back to Vienna, I like Vienna, and I've been back several times. Very interesting, thank you. Thank you both for a wonderful talk. Thank you, David, for interviewing Eric. You did a fantastic job. And thank you all for joining us this evening at the end of Tishabav. And I think we, if you can all unmute yourselves and uh, give them both a round of applause that they both deserve. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Very good. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you. Very good. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Eric, are you still there? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Hang on a minute. Don't Hi, Linda. Hi. I don't 